with Professor Sewell from Harvard. He will talk about analytic methods of constructing bundle sections and their geometric applications. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to speak in this uh, beautiful place. Uh, um, today I'm going to talk about um, what uh, people in uh, the function theory of several variables uh, worry about, at least uh, uh, maybe at least a segment of the people, and uh, what the uh, problems are, and what I can do, and what I uh, I'm doing, I try to finish, and what uh, I expect to be done, and yet I have no clue how to. Okay. Um, so I start out with the, um, uh, the main tool, which is uh, L2 estimates of the bar. Okay. So let me say something about uh, the reason for it. Of course, d bar means that um, you are taking the uh, derivative in the zero one direction for all the variables. Okay. So the vanishing means that the uh, function is holomorphic. Okay. So the whole thing uh, of the theory is to construct things holomorphic. So whether you want to say that two manifolds are the same, you construct a map between them. Or if you embed things in a projective space, make it algebraic, you construct a holomorphic section of certain line bundle. And if you say that it's Stein or uh, embeddable properly into the Euclidean space, then you construct holomorphic functions. So anything you construct holomorphic. So uh, the way to construct it uh, is to remove obstructions. So what you do is that you start out with something. First, let's say the G, which is smooth. You can always uh, get things smooth. Uh, and then the obstruction would be uh, D bar of that. And then you want to solve D bar of F equal to G. Of course, you avoid uh, putting F equal to G. Okay. So this is subject to some constraint. Okay. And what are the constraints? So one example is that uh, it would be L2 with respect to a certain weight. So that's L2 with a certain weight. And what kind of weight? For example, if locally you have coordinates uh, Z1, Zn at 0, then once you have a weight that is comparable to 1 over Z to n, dimension n, then the L2 means vanishing. L2 with respect to it means that f has to be 0. So that means that you are modifying g by something which is 0. So this one is holomorphic, and this vanishes at one point. Of course, you can make it much stronger by raising the power so that uh, this vanishing to a jet order. So you can prescribe the jets. So that is uh, the way that people construct uh, holomorphic objects by removing the obstruction. And the important thing is that you have to be. Okay, is F is 0 at 0? What is it? Yeah, F is 0 at 0. Yeah, that's right. F is 0 at 0. Yeah. Thanks. So, uh, and also if it's high power, the jet would be at 0. At zero. Yeah. So you have the main point here is I want to emphasize that this is L2. That's the reason why it enters the picture. Okay. And so it means that uh, you want to get a solution that has prescribed conditions. So you get something with prescribed conditions. So the prescribed conditions, for example, would be like the jet vanishing, or the jet uh, for F. That means this thing assuming prescribed jets. Okay. And there's another reason for it, which is actually more important. Uh, another reason for the L2 is um, to be able to remove co-dimension 1 without any penalty. So uh, people worry about singularities. 
Okay, so thing red, you cannot do calculus there, you cannot differentiate. And the thing red is, of course, the most dimension, co-dimension one. So you are able to remove co-dimension one, that means you can ignore singularities. Yeah. So uh, then, the, uh, how do you manage to do it? Because if you have L2, you can extend holomorphic function across co-dimension one singularities. Yeah. So that means that um, whatever undesirable elements there are, you just remove them and just do the things on the good ones, and then you, you make them back. So, so that's the reason for all these uh, L2 estimates. So it makes analysis far easier than algebraic geometry because you can ignore singularities. Of course, you have to pay for it. Namely, you have to get the L2 estimate. Algebraic geometry don't worry about L2 estimates. And so what are the tools for doing this, getting the L2 estimates? Um, it comes from uh, a simple exercise in uh, linear algebra. So in linear algebra, uh, you have a, a fine number of uh, linear equations with constant coefficients and a fine number of unknowns. Yeah. And uh, of course, in general, say this is m by n matrix, in general it's not solvable, so there is a compatibility condition. Namely, Sb equal to zero. This is compatibility condition. And uh, the question is to solve for the minimal solution. Minimal solution. Let's say x min. So what is the formula for it? The formula for it is t star, t t star plus s star. S inverse B. And uh, so this is uh, basic uh, linear algebra. Uh, but this is an important trick that enables one to get L2 estimates. So if you want to see this uh, exercise work out, do something like this. Okay, this is always invertible because of this condition that uh, you have no uh, uh, zero eigenvalue, vector. So you solve for this, and the main thing is to make this one zero. So this one zero. You can make this one zero, of course, this times v would be the answer. Yeah. And this uh, acting on v, of course, is orthogonal to the kernel, so that's the minimum one. And this is zero. The trick, this, this only trick here, is to apply s, and then take the inner product with respect to sv. That's the n. So you apply S, this kills this. This kills it because of compatibility, and then uh, you take the inner product, you move this S over, you have S star. So that is uh, historically how it started uh, the whole thing. And then uh, uh, the person uh, who actually did this, of course, is the, uh, the technique of Bochner and Kodaira uh, using completion of squares. So, so that is uh, uh, historically the way to do it, and I can vouch that this is correct, but this is something like this. Okay. Do a, a square. Oh, this is correct. Okay. That's the completion of squares. Okay. And this is going to be applied to the special case where t is the same as d bar, and then compatibility also the same as d bar. Okay. So in that case, what is being inverted is this operator. So this operator usually denoted by box. And so the question is whether you can invert it. Okay. Because uh, here in linear algebra exercise, it's given as precisely the compatibility condition. That means if this is satisfied, it's all solvable. But if you're a global situation, uh, oh, no, sorry. 
the global situation, the D bar close may not be D bar exact. So in general, it's not the same. And you try to uh, make this invertible. So the, it's usually also called the Weizenberg formula, minus the trace plus the curvature. So that is this completion of square in terms of the in terms of the symbols. So this part is the perfect square, and then you say that that's not the square. But uh, when you have an operator, whether you determine pos the main thing about square is determine positivity. So for operator A, for example, determine positivity, you do this. So to have the same effect as completion of square of positivity. That's how you do it. So if you take this and take the inner product, then you take actually absolute value. It's square. X square. That's actually the reason for it. So this one already is semi-positive. And you write it in another way, making it semi-positive by squeezing something out. So this is semi-positive, but you make it uh, even more track, more, more uh, uh, tractable by <coughs> squeezing something out. So if you squeeze this thing out, it's positive, then this can be inverted and it's solvable. And solvable with estimates, the L2. So that's how everything worked. And then um, the curvature has to have the right sign. OK, yeah. So the curvature has the right sign. So if you have a line bundle, then the, the metric usually is given by this. And the curvature, and some people don't put the i there. Some do, it looks like this. So if it's positive, uh, then you could invert and so forth. That's the vanishing theorem of uh, Kodara. So um, the, uh, the thing that I want to apply this to, so, so what are the questions that people want to answer? So this is the main tool of the uh, L2 estimates, very, very simple. Okay. The questions that uh, you want to apply this to is to construct a uh, section. So one, the one that um, people first wanted to do is the effective results in algebraic geometry. And then there's uh, the second thing that uh, very much uh, motivated the investigation uh, is the invariance of pre genera. I'll explain to you why these things uh, uh, come up, they seem to be uh, so unrelated. Okay. And then the third thing that motivates things uh, is the abundance conjecture. So of course, uh, you want to see how all these things are linked. Okay. And for L2 method, uh, you actually want to construct something. But solving the equation uh, does not mean that you can construct something. You have to have the right wave function to get what you want. Otherwise, you just take the original one. Okay. So the wave function should have singularities to solve it. So the whole point is about constructing good singularities, controllable good singularities. Uh, what do you mean by good? Good means that uh, the, the curvature condition has to be satisfied. That means, for example, you put in this form, phi has to be harmonic. And then uh, the singularity has to be controllable. For example, here. It's isolated at one point and with a certain order. So the, the game is that if you have uh, L2 estimates, it's not enough to produce things. And so you produce things by uh, putting in something controllable, good singularities, and then you actually use extent. Why? Because here, you want this thing to be at one point, because you want to be able to prescribe things at one point and then extend out. Okay. But if you are unable to produce things with singularity only at one point, for example, if the singularity is a curve, 
Then uh, you want to be able to prescribe. Then you have to start out with things on a curve and come go out. So then there's a question of uh, extension. So there's a question of L2 extension. And this one is a, is a special situation of that. So there's a L2 extension. And the L2 extension theory comes back to help construct singularity as well. So the extension theory goes here, here, and here. They are all linked by the L2 extension theorem. So that's why they together uh, would form the motivating force for the investigation. And then what else uh, is there? So there is uh, geometry involved in this situation. Because uh, in general, for example, uh, you cannot have section unless you have conditions. Okay. So the geometry involved, uh, for example, the curvature will help you. And for this particular uh, way of uh, finding a minimum solution, you look at the formula motivated by linear algebra. But you can also uh, do it in a more naive way. Forget about linear algebra that uh, we learned from high school. Okay. You just input by brute force, minimize. Okay. If you look for minimal solution, just minimize it. And then, uh, so you come up with the method of, uh, of variation, a calculated variation. So that means that uh, you go by steepest descent, any kind of evolution method to get to the minimum. Okay. So when you get to the minimum, then the question is, does it help you? I mean, you seem to have everything at your disposal. Why bother with something else? You have that thing from linear algebra because you have additive structure, okay, that you add something, and so forth. Sometimes if you don't have additive structure, then you cannot use it. You have to use minimizing. And uh, one important thing that also motivate, motivate everything is some semi-linear version. Semi-linear version uh, is motivated by two things. Uh, one is uh, existence of geodesic. Another is the Hodge conjecture. So you, you take the geodesic, you take a Riemannian manifold x, and uh, of course you map a circle to it, uh, and minimize it. And of course, uh, if it's a, a negative curvature, then you know that you know, stably you can get something. If it's not, then it's not clear. Okay. And uh, the Hodge conjecture actually uh, also look for a minimal representative in a class, so you have x, a Kähler manifold, or maybe algebraic, okay, Kähler manifold, algebraic. And uh, to avoid this situation uh, that uh, give you trouble because of uh, positive curvature, you assume that this is a negative curvature operator condition. That means uh, it's uh, stronger than uh, the usual negative curvature. Okay. Just to avoid uh, this trouble in the case of geodesic. Then um, uh, your question is that uh, can you represent a class by holomorphic objects, for example, sub-variety or something. And the Hodge conjecture tells you that the condition you should put in is PV type. And of course, uh, that is hard because the minimal surface and so forth is very complicated to handle, and nobody knows how to do it. Mainly, people don't know how to use the condition as PV type. And of course, uh, Blain Lawson and Harvey they did the case with boundary, and then there you have uh, you can get hold of boundary and the the, uh, the complex dimension of boundary, and then fill in the inside. When you have boundary, it's easier than without a boundary. Replacing the boundary by something uh, topological is much harder. And so when I first looked at this, it was in the 70s. Uh, so I sort of tried to imitate this. This is the geodesic. The geodesic is S1, which is a very simple thing. And uh, the S1, you can either minimize the length 
or the energy, they give you the same answer. So uh, I replace the S1 by some complex, um, compact Kähler manifold. But the class is represented continuously or topologically. So then the, you minimize the d bar energy, let's say f. Let's, this is m, for example. Minimize this. And it turns out that the vanishing of completion of squares, which is somewhere here, uh, could do the job. What was it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, this is a two in my handwriting. Okay, so. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, so the... Uh, you can actually do the uh, completion of squares. So what happens is rather simple. That um, you take the uh, tangent bundle, the one zero kind, and then uh, pull back by the f, then the df would be this thing valued zero one form on m, and then by the, the, the vanishing theorem, if this is negative in a suitable sense, then this thing vanishes. Okay, negative means that this part or this part should have the right sign. But when you pull back, uh, the curvature actually is something like the curvature of x together with df, d bar f, df by f. So you have to rule out the case that uh, this thing is actually zero. If it's not, then uh, you have negativity, and then the completion of squares Okay. would help you uh, in a dual case. That means, the dual case means you take the commutator here. The dual case actually corresponding to completion of square in another way, in this way. And then this sign gets reversed. Yeah. So that is uh, how you show that if you have uh, negative up curvature operator condition, which is sort of like to imitate what happens to uh, minimizing a link to get a geodesic, then you can represent a class. If the class is continuously representable by a compact Kähler manifold, and of course, dimensional manifold has at least two because the vanishing theorem uh, has to be the, have the vanishing if the dimension uh, is more than two, if you and you have negative curvature. And so you say that, well, isn't this uh, already the end? Not quite. Okay. So one question, which at the time I tried to answer, I, did, I couldn't. And uh, even now, I still cannot answer. But uh, let me tell you uh, what the question is. The question is about the cost decomposition for homology. And of course, you can say that it's uh, is some sort of Hodge conjecture. For homology. So what is the uh, Hodge decomposition? The Hodge decomposition tells you that when you have uh, a certain homology class, let's say HK, you can look at the ones that are representable by HPQ. So you can have the dual situation of uh, of the singular uh, uh, homology and so forth. So the question is, um, what happens to the dual case? Uh, can it be uh, representable? So the Hodge conjecture itself tells you the PP type, then uh, it could be represented by something holomorphic. That's the conjecture, holomorphically representable. Yeah. And of course, people. I don't know what you mean, well, what you mean now. But that means that uh, it's represented by some, uh, some complex uh, sub variety of co dimension P. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, 
but uh, that's only for PP. And then you represent it, uh, of course, in a, in a sense of homology, because that one is a dual one. Yeah. And then you ask, what happens to PQ? Yeah. Uh, PQ. And uh, then uh, you look at uh, the case PQ less than or equal to R, because uh, people talk about filtration. Of this is not the same kind of filtration. You take PQ less than or equal to R, and then you ask representability. By CR manifolds or image of CR map under CR map, the image of CR manifold with number of real directions less than equal to R. Reasonable. Okay. And of course, uh, you also want to keep the negative up, uh, curvature operator condition because even for the geodesic that is uh, a troublemaker. Okay. So you keep it and then the question is can you do it? Okay. At first I thought that I could easily do it uh, but things are more complicated. Let me tell you uh, what I think should be done and uh, there's a good chance that it can be done. Okay. So let me tell you. So first uh, a CR manifold M it means that the complexified tangent space has uh, complex uh, uh, vector space structure plus some real okay, tensor C. What? Tensor C. Oh, tensor C. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> real structure. Yeah. Okay. So uh, d bar b means that uh, you have the Differentiation in such directions that the, the zero one direction here is zero. Yeah, that's, that's a CR map. That means the same as holomorphic if there's no real direction. Yes. In, in zero one direction. Zero. So what do you do in this case? Suppose you assume that you have a continuous image, you know, just imitating this. Uh, uh, this the, this part is known as strong rigidity because uh, it put uh, Mostow's uh, work in. Uh, in a more geometric setting. So here you have, um, for example, a continuous image into X. And you minimize it. So what do you minimize? You minimize d bar b square, okay, yeah, d bar b energy, yeah. and so forth. Yeah? Just imitate. Again, the kind is the kind of the brain also did with the CR. Uh, <coughs> so, and then um, you want to show that you are vanishing. Okay. Then the quad, the trouble is that uh, the completion of the square doesn't quite work. There is no precise vanishing. Precise vanishing means uh, the kind that Kodara had L plus K X equal to zero. There's no such vanishing for d bar b. Why? Because, um, for example, when you take a uh, strongly pseudo-convex complex manifold, which means that, let's say y, which means there's exhaustion function, <coughs> let's say from zero to infinity, a proper map, and it's strongly pseudo-convex, pseudo -con uh, pseudo uh, strongly pseudo-convex means uh, strictly harmonic on the inverse image of, let's say, the C and infinity, okay, for C sufficiently large. Huh? There's near the boundary. Okay, that's strongly pseudo-convex. Then it doesn't give you the... Um, vanishing of cohomology because there's something inside in the middle. Yeah. So the model in the middle is finite dimensional. Okay. But of course we don't even have this situation because the boundary, this M here is like the boundary of Y or something like inverse of A or something. Yeah. You, is this, do you want the pseudo-concave then? Pseudo-convex. So outside of pseudo-convex? Yeah, strictly proves harmonic. Yeah, that that's strongly pseudo-convex domain. Yeah, but this is the 
you're, it's reversed because you're going to infinity. <coughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, okay. So here is why it goes to infinity here. And, and this part is strongly pseudo convex. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, so there is something uh, in the middle that gives you trouble. For example, blow up and so forth. You don't know what's in the middle, it gives you trouble. So actually, you don't have vanishing. So, for example, suppose you have this situation, you have a continuous uh, image of the boundary of something strongly pseudo convex. Okay. Then you don't expect to have the vanishing. Uh, you know there's something in the middle. And uh, so how do you people handle it? This was handled by Grauert in the solution of Levy problem. Do you assume P plus Q is odd? What? Do you assume P plus Q is odd? Because you're using a C on P plus Q. In P plus Q. Well, it, it, yeah, in this case, it's one, but uh, you have other possible cases, too. The, 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 the complex tangent space has to be even dimension over the real. But then the real one is up to you, maybe one, you know, whatever. So, so this, this simple case is the case R equal to one. So, so then you say, how do you handle it? Uh, this is done by the bumping technique. And the bumping technique of Grauert in solving uh, the Levy problem. So the Levy problem is the following. So he started out with this picture. And then he wanted to produce holomorphic functions. So then this is a map, in his case, he won't just want to map into C or C big N. Okay. So then you ask, uh, didn't he have the same trouble? Indeed, he had the same trouble. But he had a clever way of handling it. He argues that uh, the, the Y here, you take a strongly pseudo-convex boundary, and you bump it a little bit. It's still strongly pseudo-convex. Let's just call this uh, big one y tilde, the small one, y. With the bump, it's y tilde. Then he said that um, even though you bump it, the cohomology for the big one and the slightly smaller one are the same. They are actually all in the center. Even if you bump it, they are all the same. Okay. And then how do you produce something uh, even though you have trouble in the center? So he said that you take a coherent shift f. It works for any coherent shift. And then here, you can take some local sub-variety, uh, which is outside of y, but which is inside y tilde. And the ideal shift defining is i. Then in that case, you take uh, h0 of y tilde of uh, f and then h1 y tilde of if and then h1 y tilde of uh, f. Hey, sorry, one more, I forgot one more. So here h0 y tilde of f, here h0 y tilde of f over if. Okay? Yeah, this long exact sequence. Yeah? And you restrict it. You restrict it. But the main thing is this bump is uh, outside. So these two are the same. And if the restrictions are the same, because they have the same inside trouble, then this map is mapped to 0, and this is surjective. <coughs> That's how it's done. Okay. And that's this is the bumping technique. The bumping technique means that you get something else that has the same trouble in the center. Okay, so, so at that time, a long time ago, I thought that I could easily get the bumping technique. And let me tell you how one should do it. Okay, even though I couldn't quite do it yet. Well, yet maybe I could. Do it. So, uh, what happens is let's make the uh, easy assumption. So you, if you have only one m, a CR, let's just like r equal to one strongly pseudo convex. That's the simplest case. 
and mapping this into x. Yeah? And before you can bump anything, let's assume that m tilde is inside some y as a strip. So maybe m tilde, call it m tilde. Oh. So here is m. And then the, here you have a little bit more. Okay. This thing always exists. If it's strongly zero convex and so forth. Yeah? Okay. You have a strip. Okay. So of course, topologically, it doesn't matter which one is being used. And then you follow power and bump it. bump it. And then you want to say that you can choose one uh, somehow that, that works to produce it. But I st I'm still am not successful with this yet. Because uh, this part here is quite fixed. But of course, the whole thing may move around a bit. Yeah. So this is uh, sem a semi-linear version of bumping that has not been done. So, so I, I sort of sidetrack a little bit. Let's go back to these things. Can you see what happens to the d bar v energy when you do this bump? Yeah, that's something that one has to understand. <laughs> because here in Grauss, uh, you, you I, I completely understood what's going on. That means uh, they are the same class and so forth, and they are slightly different. But I, I had trouble. It was a long time ago in the late 70s. I had trouble handling it, and looking at it, I still cannot quite handle it. But I think uh, this would help us to understand more this bumping technique of uh, getting something in the middle. It's most of the things in, outside the same, except this bump, which uh, <laughs> we will help you handle this. Okay. So let's go back to the, uh, the thing, what happens here. So the, they are all related to the question of pure canonical sections. So let me tell you how this thing got started. Yeah. The thing got started uh, first uh, because of Poincaré. So when you have uh, a uh, hyperbolic compact Riemann surface, let's call it M, then you can uh, use the uniformization theorem. And then it's represented by the discrete subgroup. Okay. The question that was first raised is that when you have Riemann surface, uh, historically, uh, they were defined by uh, equations, okay, like complex curves and so forth. And then, of course, after the uniformization, they can be described this way, and uh, how to reconcile the two things. So suppose you are given something like this. Then can you embed it in a projective state? So uh, Poincaré's idea is uh, to embed you use a canonic, you use a line bundle, and uh, the only line bundle that works always is a canonical line bundle. You take the canonical line bundle raised to a power. So he first, uh, before raising it, he first just take the whole thing, and you take a holomorphic function phi, let's say bounded, okay, on it, on delta, and then take the sum of uh, gamma star phi of gamma over gamma. And uh, of course, uh, this thing, the question of convergence and, and whether there are enough of them to embed. Now, in general, you cannot because this thing is compact. The function wouldn't do it. So then uh, one takes uh, forms like this. Okay. And then the question is whether it converges. And his idea is that you take a square that automatically converges. Because the Jacobian determinant is given by the DW DC epsilon square. So if you take the square on this here, you take a certain fundamental domain. Then the, if you map, then it's modified by this thing here. So precisely modified by that. And uh, since the total area is bounded, so this thing converges. Okay. And actually, uh, the reason why it converges is because when you go to a boundary, it gets smaller and smaller. So you raise to a higher power, it's easier to converge. So it's sufficiently large m that it converges in bed. So the question that motivates 
was what happens to the high dimensional case. So this is still remains a conjecture. So if you have x with the canonical line bundle positive and a complex dimension n, then you want to say that uh, all the sections of mkx would embed x to our n if m is at least n plus 3. For surface, was done. For even for three dimension, I think it's not uh, known. But if you are willing to uh, uh, raise this uh, thing a little bit, like uh, for the cube, then it, you're done. Actually, this follows from something I uh, did with a student of mine, Angren, uh, in the uh, mid 1990s. Uh, so then the, the question then. From this, there are two questions. Uh, one is uh, so-called Fujita conjecture. One is the uh, Matsuzaka big theorem. The Fujita conjecture tells you that L positive, then uh, you have uh, x of uh, ML plus kx free. That means uh, every point there is a section uh, that is non-zero. Another thing that uh, embeds, so free for m at least n plus 1, and embed for m at least n plus 2. Okay. So Matsuzaka uh, simply wants to get a number without this thing. And uh, this number, uh, in general, depends on ln and ln plus 1 kx. That's how it works. But free just means no base points, or right. yeah, free or base point. Yeah. So the thing that I, uh, because I wanted to wrap up this thing. So for the freeness, uh, is something that I did uh, with Anger, and then later improved by the uh, higher and other people uh, with the square. So with, I think I can I got a square, uh, and I think higher give uh, four over three. And, but this is for the free case, for the very ample. I mean, this case, I could only get, so I'm about to post that, uh, thing, the paper on the internet, but I haven't done it yet. That means that there exists a explicitly computable mn, depending on n, uh, such that this is true when m is bigger than equal to m over n. And now, instead of telling you the detail of this, the idea of, the, of these proofs are just to create the controllable singularities. But since uh, I have only about 15 minutes, I think. And MN is polynomial? MN is polynomial? Or? Uh, yeah, essentially polynomial, I think. But, but the, the simple version would, would involve the exponent. If polynomial, you have to work harder. Okay. But it doesn't matter. It's, 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 the, the, the thing I have at this point is uh, exponential, exponential, very large. But, uh, uh, but it should be polynomial. I think you want more careful about this. Yeah. But the method uh, is still rather limited, controlling the singularity. Okay. So since I have only 15 minutes, you, are, you guys are on time. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I want to. Um, um, tell you something about this. Okay. I've been looking at this for quite some time, and at one time I thought that I could easily handle it, but there's uh, one thing I still need, uh, one es estimate I still need to handle this that is more precise than what I can do. So let me explain to you about this uh, abundance conjecture. Okay. Uh, to me, as an analyst, the abundance conjecture actually is related to uh, a priori estimates by adding an epsilon times a good operator, so elliptic or something, 
and then letting epsilon go to zero. <laughs> so that is uh, my reason of looking at it, because I uh, reach out because uh, uh, we look at it very differently. Okay. So in analysis, uh, if you are unable to do it, uh, you make it a little bit better first, and then later you remove it. Okay. So the, uh, the statement is as follows, that you have x is the algebraic compact algebraic manifold, and then you are interested in the Puri canonical uh, sections is for embedding. The reason why Puri canonical things are useful is that in the in way back, people want to understand algebra by using geometry, the one in correspondence. Okay. And uh, so if you have manifold, as you manifold, you look at the metamorphic function and fill on it. But the two things are not equivalent, the two things, because uh, uh, when you blow up, you cannot see the difference. Okay. But the Puri canonical sections are unwell to blow up. So you take Puri canonical things, it's a very nice thing. Okay. So the, the question is that uh, if you take Puri canonical things, uh, there are a lot of those to help you. And of course, um, you, you want eventually map x into something. Okay. And uh, so the matter is about the matter of the growth order. So this, uh, the growth order, this thing is called the uh, Kodara dimension. And if you want to say that this is of certain Kodara dimension, then you have to explicitly produce sections. But you have trouble doing it, because produce sections use L2 estimates of d bar, and you need some positivity. So what you do is you add something that is positive, line bundle. So it's ample. You add it first, like this. To help you do it, let's say prime or something. Okay. And then want to say that these two are the same. That means you add a little bit of positivity, eventually it doesn't matter. Okay. Now, how do you handle this? The question, how do you handle this? Okay. So the, the handling of this, the interesting part, is that if you try to, so roughly, let me roughly tell you what the main points are. So here in this case, you can get some curvature for the canonical line bundle, some metric. Okay. So uh, how do you get this kind of thing? So the, if you have uh, good curvature, then the completion of squares will give you sections. On the other hand, when you have sections, you can also get a metric that has some positivity. So the way is that if you take a line bundle L, and you, you have sections, S1, SL, for example, then a metric would look like this. There would be a metric for it. Because you take another section, you take the square that's well defined, independent of the transition functions. Okay. And because absolute value is taken, actually you don't need section, you can take multi value sections. With absolute value. Multi value section means raised to a certain power becomes a section, because absolute value is the only concern. So you can relate the two things. These sections would give you metric, and this metric, this thing is pretty harmonic, because of the way it's written. Okay. So there's a link between the two things, uh, the section. So when you have something like this, so you have a lot of uh, sections like this. Of course, they are not multi-value sections. They are multi-value sections of this thing. You can still form the metric. And then you can take limit, because this is over m. And then you would get a metric coming from this. It's a natural metric, okay, so far as singularity is concerned. And this gives you a curvature. Now, if the curvature has uh, positivity, then, of course, you can just use uh, the completion of squares and handle it. But the problem is that this is semi-positive. Of course, you say there are singularity and so forth, but the analysts don't really care 
don't much about it, senior writers take them away. Okay. So, but the main point is that they have null spaces. Null spaces. Okay. So null spaces was something called form something like a foliation. Is this null space? Okay. You don't really know whether the uh, fibers are compact. So it was some sort of foliation. And the main problem, does it give you compact fiber or some vibration? Vibration, then you can look at the quotient. And in a quotient, you have the positivity. And then you get it. Yeah. So the, the main, this is the main trouble, the foliation together with vibration. So the question, how do you handle it, the foliation? How, how do you make a foliation vibration? And this works only for the canonical line bundle. And then you say, why? Okay. And the, the method that I've been using is the method that involves arithmetic. Uh, it's the method of Galvan Schneider. And generalized by Bombieri. This is 1934. This is 1970. Okay. So the uh, original is to answer the question of Hilbert uh, about whether this thing is algebraic or not. If a is not zero one, and b is algebraic irrational. So um, Bombieri, let me write down Bombieri's version. But my version is following that uh, you have uh, f1, fk, meromorphic function on Cn uh, of uh, finite type, rho, for example. Okay. So that means that it's, it's a quotient of two things, and each thing is exponential z rho or something. Yeah? And then the, um, the transcendence degree. It's bigger than equal to m plus 1. Okay, this n, same as this n. Moreover, you have an algebraic number field. And the first order derivative of each fj belongs to k of f1, fk. Then the conclusion is that the set of all s such that the fjp is in k for j from 1 to k is contained in a hypersurface of degree uh, bounded by something explicit involving rho and k. It doesn't matter what this thing is. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so that was used to uh, handle the problem. Okay. So uh, how is this related to what we are doing? In our case, it is uh, something more general, but roughly the same setting. So, you have here your x, for example, and then you have these foliations. For these foliations, uh, the uh, kx is trivial for each one because this is zero curvature. Yeah. And also because of the is kx, the let's look at the simplest case of dimension one. Okay. The high dimension is more complicated, but it's the same. That uh, in this case the canonical line bundle here uh, is trivial or the fiber. Trivial. Okay. And uh, so this is set the set the stage of this thing here. And how is this thing proved? But the foliation is actually homomorphic foliation? Is what? Is it's, so the, you've got the null directions for, yeah, your, yeah. for your semi-positive form. That's right. So a priori, you could get a foliation where, where the leaves were complex, but maybe it's not a homomorphic foliation. Yeah, yeah. But, but you're not concerned with that. It's no, no. Individual leaves. No. So. Well, actually, uh, we are moving to a generic leaves also, yeah. But uh, let, let me, let me, let me <laughs> finish this first. Okay. So you have uh, uh, this picture. And, and how is this thing proved? Okay, this is the key point. 
the proof of this thing is that you take a polynomial of f1, fk of relatively low degree. And the fact that they are transcendence means that this thing is not identically zero. Okay. And then you take log. This thing is actually being used as a metric for the trivial line bundle. Maybe it's a square, doesn't matter. And then you take dd bar of that. And you want this of low degree, and yet high vanishing order at a fine number of points here. And then you divide, as a current, you divide by the vanishing order. And then you take limit as the degree of this polynomial gets bigger and bigger. And then the total mass is being handled uh, by the type situation and by the height requirement. Because this thing here belongs to number field. So when you take the polynomial, not only that the degree wants to be low, because there are more than n. It's n plus 1. So you can take the degree lower. Okay. And moreover, you can choose the coefficients at the point that uh, they belong to number field. You can choose the coefficients of controllable height. Here's the main point, height control. Then you take dd bar the log, and you apply the Navarina theory, the first main theorem. The first main theorem has one term, which is usually denoted by O1. But actually, the term is minus log of this thing at 0. If you only only one function, then Navarina just put an O1. But here, eventually, you let this thing go to infinity, the degree and the vanishing order. Then that term matters. And that term, uh, the growth of the term is governed by the height estimate. Okay. So that's how it's proved. And now, let's go back to our picture. So our picture, this one, would take the place of C. Okay. And this thing here will be replaced by x0 of x mkx plus a. And, uh, the, and then uh, when you have certain growth order, then you can make linear combinations uh, vanishing certain order at certain point. Yeah. And we are, with the m here, we are not taking a polynomial because the m takes care of that already. Yeah. And then um, you have this vanishing order. And when you take limit, this thing disappears. And you get the contradiction that um, the uh, curvature is 0 here, and yet you still have this vanishing order. The curvature uh, is related to this row, actually, the growth. Yeah. So uh, you would get a contradiction. And this is the method of using the Galvan Schneider. Okay. So what is the trouble uh, at this point? Okay. The trouble at this point is precisely the height estimates. So how do you produce sections here with high estimates? Here is produced with the Siegel's lemma. Okay, you solve linear equations, and the coefficients belong to some field with the heights and so forth. You just count, pigeonhole. Okay. But he, here we are more complicated. We do not construct these polynomials. These things are given in a way, not exactly given. Okay. But then how do you construct it with a height? Okay. So to construct it, the way I do it is first interpret the, uh, the condition. No more here. The condition is a kappa prime of x yeah? Yeah. in terms of um, uh, the decomposition of the curvature. Remember that. I take the uh, sections, and then I form the metric, and then I form the curvature. Okay. So there's a curvature here. The curvature is an old simple theorem I prove has a decomposition. Minor. Yeah. And uh, the, uh, this thing is interpreted first in terms of these things. Okay. And then the second thing is that you use this thing. These things actually give you positivity. 
this thing is to construct the section. So it's a roundabout way. You just don't say that you have the given sections of a certain growth order. Then it doesn't work because you don't have control over the height. So you interpret this first in terms of this. And from this, you construct section of the height. The construction here use L2 estimates and the extension. And then the main question is, can you do L2 estimates not just a comedian sense, but height? So for height, um, you have to appeal to the algebraic version of the vanishing theorem. The algebraic version of the vanishing theorem was due to Lucy and uh, Deline, I think. It was in the mid-80s. And the idea of the proof actually is to use a singular metric. So uh, it's like this. So you have x, and then you have a line bundle. And uh, you take a certain high power, you get a section. And then the, this uh, section is non-singular divisor, and then divisor y. And then it's by induction uh, to get the vanishing from x. And using the metric, which is this, actually divided by n. Using a metric like this is singular. And then you take log and you take d bar, you go over something like completion of squares. And the curvature of dd log of dd bar actually is uh, so called the Poincare alone or Cauchy integral formula to give the y itself. Well, the right thing. Yeah. And uh, so the uh, completion of square in the curvature term is the restriction because this is a y. And so you can use induction and get it. But the main difficulty is once you use the induction step by step, the constant you get is far worse than you can do it with the L2. And uh, it was, I just couldn't uh, 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 manipulate things, uh, because you can always try to improve on this thing too. But uh, I got stuck for a couple of years, still stuck a bit uh, with this uh, <laughs> estimate. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I just, I think my time is up. So I just want to give you some sense of uh, what these L2 estimates are about and what problems uh, they are supposed to solve. I think even if you can solve the Hodge conjecture, the big thing. I mean, the abundance conjecture also is uh, you know, semi big. But, uh, yeah. Thanks. Comment. So, yeah. so in this strategy, uh, you're not. Eventually, you'd like to conclude that, that these leaves are actually compact, complex amount of Yeah, enough of them, yeah. No, not many, it doesn't matter if it's manifold. We, we can ignore it. You, as long as you can take the potion. Right. Singularity doesn't matter much. Yeah. And in fact, you're, you're, you, you hope to eventually prove that you've got a holomorphic foliation. But at this stage, you, you don't know any of that. You could have open leaves. Yeah, yeah, you, you know, very yeah. non-holomorphically. Yeah. But as long as they are transcendental, then you get contradiction already. Because the, matter, the, the thing is just the counting. It's a matter of the counting, you know, the degree and the vanishing and so forth, whether it's identically zero. Just imitating that part. But since it involves something arithmetic, uh, then it, it's, uh, it's a messy at this point. Yeah. Any other questions? First of all, uh, Professor C will be here also tomorrow. He's in Mark's, uh, Mark de Cataldo's office, so if you are interested in topic with him, he will be around tomorrow. And we are going to dinner tonight, and Sam is coordinating this, so just stop by. So let's thank Professor C. Also.